welcome everyone to this Q&A opportunity on the fourth day of our summer session. Um, I had the feeling yesterday that the questions were kind of settling and slowing down, but uh, please, if anything has bubbled up, in your own practice or from the talk, um, feel free to chat or raise a hand. In the meantime, um, I have two little gems of poems that just kind of came to mind while Marianne was um, doing that amazing offering for us, uh, movement, uh, sort of joining in and watching and letting these um, friends, these verses surface. Many of you will have heard them. The first um, has so much to do with what it is we do and with what we both do. Um, this is from a little book uh, that I've been very grateful for called The First Free Women. The First Free Zen Women or The First Free Women. Maybe the subtitle is has Zen in it. It's really um, poems that are inspired by the Theragata uh, in the early Pali Canon, which includes... Um, well, there's, it's hard to have an exact count but some 60 or more verses by enlightened women. Uh, either their enlightenment verses, that was a tradition, uh, or just a verse from the depths of practice. And um, the poems in this First Free Women are inspired by those charagata, so they're not exact translations. <clears throat> And they're named for just the name of the woman. So this one is called Another Sama because there are two. This is her poem. After 25 years on the path, I'd experienced almost everything except peace. When I was young, my mother told me that I would find true happiness only in marriage. Remembering her words all those years later, something in me began to tremble. I gave myself to the trembling, and it showed me all the pain this little heart had ever known and how countless lives of searching had brought me at last to the present moment, which I happily married. Can you imagine? We've been living together ever since without a single argument. That's really true. Um, some time ago, I um, met with a student who had been listening, you know, to apps, and mentioned Locke Kelly. You know, one of the many really wonderful teachers that's uh, out there teaching in the form of guided meditations or just guidance. And I thought, well, I'll just check this out. And so I, you know, happened to go on to waking up, which of course I know because of Henry. Um, and just scrolled through and tapped on one with Locke Kelly. And it was a short meditation on this question. What is there? 
when there's no problem to be solved. I think that's how he put it. And, you know, I think I was listening while falling asleep. Really wonderful. I, I do recall that the first time he asked the question, you know, it's quiet and he just would drop the question in. What is there when there's no problem to be solved? And I'm in a sense of repose, you know, evening, sleeping, getting in that direction. But immediately there was this little tiny sense of one, one little thing like on the very outer edge of whatever this is, you know, it, was, it seemed like there was some, like, if I could reach, you know, way out to the farthest reaches of awareness somehow in that moment, that's what it seemed like. I don't really think there's an edge, but it was as though there was a reach and there was this little holding and what came up was just this question spontaneously. You mean I have to let go of that too? <laughs> and then, you know, as soon as that came up, just, I, there's really, part of what we're doing here is, these, you know, things come up, whatever it is, and all of this still, still sitting, nevertheless, we all know it. And there's this very real quality that when you turn the light of sitting on that, when you just let it come and see it in that light, you see through it. It's, it can almost be simultaneous. Just to see it is to see through it. Not necessarily. Sometimes we see it and we see, oh, there's an entanglement and it's, you know, then you can invite space, you can explore, you can allow. Um, but so with Locke Kelly, I, I sort of had smiled, you know, like, well, okay, fell asleep. And the next day I was, um, you know, had a little break and was walking from one room to the next. And somehow that, that sense of that question, even though I, I don't remember thinking it, it was there. That's um, actually how a koan can be and uh, how these questions can function. You know, we're not grinding, we're not looping in them. They're just out there and they, they sort of float in or drop in. And there was just a moment and I still remember exactly where I was in our house, walking from one room to the next, where somehow that question came, and for a moment, everything disappeared. And you'd think, well, that's kind of weird, or how is that helpful? It was wonderful. <laughs> this freedom, just stepping, just absolute effortlessness. You know what? No one doing anything, just for that moment. And it really felt as though that came from that question. What is there? when there's no problem to be solved. And it's just a way of inviting us into this. You know, the, the world is broken and troubled, as are our hearts. And yet, in this moment, really this, you can't, you can't divide it, you can't find an edge. There's no problem. And out of that then comes 
as we know out of this practice, I think. It really generates compassion. Compassion in the sense of wonder that there is anything at all. You know, I was talking about this today, just this, just any of us here, we're here. We, it's nothing but compassion. And there's also this way that, that this practice like that moment of disappearing or even just sitting in it, whatever it is, and staying there, really tends to open our hearts and how can I help comes up. You know, what is mine to do? Strange because that I, me, mine just gets looser and looser and more and more transparent and less entangled and out of that spaciousness and freedom, you kind of come into the simplicity of being exactly who you are. And then what is mine to do? How can I help? Okay, there was one more poem, but I'm getting some questions. <laughs> oh, somebody, thank, great, somebody posted the book, thank you, by Maddie Weingast. Um, so here's one other that uh, anybody who's ever been at the Mountain Cloud intro class has probably heard. But uh, this is by Sylvia Ostertag, who was this, uh, this beautiful Sambo Zen teacher. Um, when I began teacher training, she was... Uh, a lively fixture at our gatherings, just offering the support and engaging the Roshi. So when our faltering came up, she would just, you know, come forth and sort of rescue us and delight him. And uh, the Dharma was just coming out all over the place. And um, so she was a, a Zen master and teacher when I met her, then associate master, then Roshi, um, a cellist, a mime artist. She uh, did this wonderful body work, um, you know, sort of a mixture of psychology and movement that she had helped to develop and has passed on now to others. And she had a lot of students. And every morning, I think no matter what, she sat. And every night, no matter what, she sat. Um, sorry, just getting a message. <laughs> Let's finish this. Oh. Too late. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see it, Henry. <laughs> He's chatting at me. Um, I'll say something about that. Um, I've gone down this path, so I'm going to offer it to you. Maybe there will be another poem tomorrow. This one is called Think Not Thinking. Excuse me, it's just called Not Thinking with a dash. Sitting in silence is a way to enter a state of mind in which we rest in the space of the unconditioned. If we have found such a state, we recognize that we have always rested in this space of the unconditioned. But how can we reach this state? Just now, the best we can do is not to think about it. Then what? Really, the best we can do now is not thinking. Not thinking is an action. You do not believe it, then you are not yet 
doing it. No sooner do you do it, not thinking, than resting in the space of the unconditioned takes place. Sylvia just had this practice and um, it grew into two volumes of poetry of sitting you know, morning and night and now and then writing a poem. I think they were very helpful to her students as they are now. So there is now a question. I found the ritual at the end of each evening's last sit to be very powerful and moving. Can you help illumine its meaning? What is the Japanese text poem that Scott recites? Why the drumming and striking of the wooden mallet? And the final resonant statement on the urgent matter of life and death. Are those Dogen's words? Thank you. Yeah. Um, there is a traditional closing and it's done uh, a little, just slightly in variations, but it's basically this framework. People who are old timers at Mountain Cloud, I've been so touched by the patience and resolve <laughs> just to let it be as we sort of adapt. Uh, so, um, Scott has been chanting at the close of day, the four vows of the Bodhisattva uh, in Japanese. And, uh, you know, this is just a tradition. And I, I grew up in Zen with a fair amount of Japanese chanting, which now, you know, eventually all got translated into English. Understandably, people um, want to know what they're saying, want to, uh, you know, it can be helpful. It makes sense. But there's a, a beauty to also just intoning. You know, we, we can, I mean, now we all know it's the four vows. But, you know, you don't have to know that somehow the sound itself, Shujo Muezegando. There's a, uh, just as I do that, there's a nice little essay, um, now dated, but um, where Robert Aitken takes up the Japanese. Uh, characters and unpacks them. And it's just a tricycle online uh, article. So if you Google um, four vows in Japanese or Robert Aitken four vows, that tricycle article will come up and there are others. Um, so we chant it, Scott has been chanting it on behalf of all of us um, because of COVID really where we've been asked Apparently, singing is like the last thing that we should all be doing in a room together. So he's been doing it for all of us. And um, following that, there is this traditional ceremony with the drum and either a big bell or a gong, or I've been places where it was you know, a smaller bell just because that's what they had. Uh, and then the Han, which is this big wooden board. And the first part of that ceremony, the drum and the bell or the gong or the bell, whatever the apparatus, the instruments are that are available is really telling time. So we stop sitting here and then have about uh, eight, you know, eight twenty-five, a little after. Then comes 
the Shiku Zeganman, the four vows. And then, you know, Joe and I have been walking out of the Zendo. And so any time between 8.30 and 8.45, you get to intone eight plus three quarters of an hour, which is personally my favorite. Like I, when I did this with Henry once, uh, it was so wonderful. We had the chance for a, a big, um, I think it was a NASC session. And you know, so there were North American Sambos in, 60, 70 people there. And yeah, yeah, it was, it was here in Santa Fe, at that beautiful place and uh, the Carmelite Center. And so we were out there and we had this drum and we hung and we had a bell and there was a gong and, and we cheated because then, you know, the closing might be like at 901 or something, but then you should hit the drum nine times and the bell once. And it's just prettier to hit the bell three times, which is 845. And any time between 830 and, uh, well, that may be loose. Maybe it's supposed to be 845 to nine, but we've been uh, generally saying, here's the time. And, you, you know, that's noting this, absolutely fleeting, you know, already gone. Here it is. Um, the verse that I've been reciting um, is all about this matter of life and death, this matter of prime importance, resolving the matter of life and death. And everything bears the mark of impermanence. Everything passes quickly by like a fleeting arrow. You know, it's this call, like, don't miss it. It's, all, it's this, it's, it's gone, but here, here, but gone. So it, it, it's sort of beautiful that we're out there telling you the time, you know, blink and you'll miss it. And then comes the Han. First, those four strikes, the verse, and then it's supposed to represent 108 strikes on the Han. Uh, I've never been anywhere where that was exactly counted. Uh, but there are three cycles, and you know, of this Accelerando with the striking of the Han, and altogether 108, which I, I've, I got criticized once by somebody for saying this, but it, you know, it's these 108 delusions that are being stamped out. That's one way of, of thinking of that, but actually it's just sound. I've heard many times that Yasutani Roshi, uh, Roshi that we'd read about if you read the three pillars of Zen, would always say in a closing comment on you know, one of those nights after the sort of little ceremony, this symphony and verse, he would say, if you can hear just one sound as it truly is, really hear just one sound, your practice is at an end. You know, I, the next thing that wants to come out of my mouth is like, then you can begin. <laughs> but it, it, you, so just letting the sound fall, fall. There was this, you know, very famous koan that came to us from Master Baswi, who hears? And Baswi asks, as does Wu Men or Momon, in a comment. And uh, Momon Khan, Gateless Gate, 
does the sound come to the ear or the ear go to the sound? You know, what's, what is that? Drum or that whack. Who hears? You know, when you hear that whack, where are you? What if it's just whack? Yeah, so, you know, as Zen takes root in the West, um, I love Henry's analogy for that, this uh, dwarf oak tree that lives 900 years and the first 300 it's uh, growing and the next 300 it's living as a dwarf oak tree, this tree. And the last 300, it's dying. And with Zen and the West, we're in that first 300. And it's changing, of course. And one of the questions about it is well, about these rituals. So, you know, there's far less ritual here at Mountain Cloud than if we were to go to a session in Japan, even at the home base of Sambo Zen. Um, though it would be very recognizable. So if you're ever inclined when they open up again, that's quite an experience and uh, people are welcome from all over the world and really helped. Um, very gracious, but it's very, very traditional. You know, you sleep where you sit, you eat where you sit. Uh, and personally, this is an aspect of Zen in the West that I love. I mean, here at Mountain Cloud, you know, I, I know there's there's been a longing for expansion and building out the kitchen and the dining room, but as one coming in, it's just, how beautiful. And we, we go in silence to the dining room. And when we're all there, the jiki or the monitor claps the clappers. And we bow and we recite this verse together. And we go through the line of this you know, beautifully prepared food. Beautiful to look at, delicious. Uh, you know, the the Tenzo, the cook, in the monastery was a very important role and we are getting that here, thanks to Nick. So all of these um, aspects of ritual, they help. Uh, but I, I love sitting at a table, you know, eating with a implements that I'm familiar with, knowing what to do. Um, and I really like sleeping in a bed. That's, that's really nice. Bathrooms, you know, we have enough that we're not lined up 10 deep waiting. Um, yeah, so anyway, I've kind of gotten off. Uh, thank you for that question. It's, it's really nice to talk about. And, you know, um, maybe somebody here knows I, I used to think that this verse uh, had its source in Dogen, but right at this moment, I'm not sure. And I have heard, uh, you know, they're, they're really different translations. The one that we're doing here, um, Ruben Habito Roshi had a hand in and it's uh, translating and it's, it's, much longer than the Japanese, which is just stunning to hear. Um, very, when the, when the closing verse, you know, here we, I'm saying, I humbly proclaim before the Sangha, like I should have been saying, resolving the matter of life and death is of prime importance. You know, and, and it's, it's, I don't know, a bunch of lines. The Japanese is just four lines. All, all said in four lines and, and kind of 
sung in this haunting, wilting up and down, really mannered. Um, and again, it, it just, it's rather wonderful not to understand, just to hear that. Somehow you get it. Anyone else? You know, every time uh, this, this last chat was, um, oh, Henry's just asking, can I ask Ryan again? Um, oh, if you want to raise your hand again, our speaker disconnected. So that was uh, a little technical thing here. Oh, great, Ryan. Okay, sorry, I was trying to type out my question. Um, so in noting, um, sometimes when I have a deep sit, I start to really feel like the, cir the circulation in my body, kind of like my heartbeat. And then I, I won't be able to like focus solely on the breath. And I don't think that's a problem, but then I'll start hearing like a rhythm in my breath kind of tied in with the heartbeat. But then like sometimes I lose noting Mu in that, or sometimes like I start hearing like a rhythm in my head instead of the sensations themselves. And then like my breath will change and I'll find myself like following the rhythm in my head of how my heartbeat and breath were before rather than how they actually are. And maybe I'm just overthinking it and maybe just Noticing that and continuing to note Mu and whatever is attached to it is fine. But I didn't know if that was a good resolution or not. To um, our resistance, you know, it was an earworm question. Um, and yours is a little more elaborate, but. Um, I, as you were, we were just sitting here in the silence, I was about to say what a fan I've become of this teaching of allowing. And that when that happens, we, we could come to experience the space, you know, whatever's coming up, which seems to have this content and sometimes some contraction or a sense of entanglement and then you allow it and you give it the space and you actually, it can happen that it's the spaciousness that we start to really be drawn into and experience. And I found that uh, helpful in, in so many different ways. Um, so I just remember yesterday, Henry, I thought giving a very helpful response about for the earworm that rather than, you know, trying to get rid of that, to really look at that resistance, allow that. Um, so whatever is coming up. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I know Henry's here. He might, he might like to stay and say something. Um, he said in a chat, it's a long journey fine to travel many terrains. Uh, Henry's now the co-host if he wants to speak. Uh, he may not. That's absolutely fine, no, no need, but you're so near. Um, you know, years ago at the Maria Kanan Zen Center, we had um, this really lovely man who came to a few retreats, came regularly to sit in. And um, he had an artificial heart. And, you know, the Zendo was only a little, I mean, it was smaller than Mountain Cloud, but it was, you know, a nice long oblong room. And uh, you could hear his heart anywhere in the room and the silence. You could, it, the first time I heard it, I, I couldn't imagine 
first of all, what is that? And then, you know, I real I I think I think he said something, or maybe Ruben did. Um, you know, because in the quiet, it was just it was like a a microphone over somebody's heart. And our hearts, I, I think, have little irregularities, and this one was just, you know, this mechanical heart. So uh, I, I mean, part of sitting, you know, in that context was, you know, to to take in that sound and and let it do what it would. Or uh, how how do you how do you move into that or count or you know whatever uh, the many terrains you're in and. You know, I've been at retreats where um, I've been seated near someone who breathed, their, their breathing was quite audible. You know, was some, something about, um, you know, kind of adding a sound to the breath, maybe helping somebody feel like they're really concentrating and focusing, but it can drive the person near you you know, kind of crazy, which is probably a good practice. Um, but it was interesting that this heart, which was louder than anything like that, that I've ever heard, immediately um, elicited compassion. So no problem. So that might be another response rather than thinking, thinking about this, where it's going, where it's going, just turn that light of compassion and check out the terrain. Thanks, Brian, for hanging in there with the question. So I think we've come to a good time to pause this. Oh, oh, please, Annie. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed to ask this question, but in your talk this morning with the 10 directions and the bright pearl, one of the, um, or two of the things that the commentator mentioned were supernatural powers and magic. And I came to this retreat with a firm belief in at least magic, but I had no idea that that would enter into Zen at all. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, there's a spectrum of what we mean by that. Um, but Master Kazan, in this case, was really uh, a little bit unusual. I mean, there, there are instances of, um, you know, people practicing and sort of being drawn into that. But for the most part, you know, Zen is my supernatural power is chopping wood and carrying water. Uh, wow, yeah, what a wonder. Um, you know, there's a famous story with Mumon or Woman gets cited a lot by me. I, I, I've heard Henry mention it, um, several books where, you know, there's a neighboring Milan is becomes ordained and quite well known. He's published this collection of koans, and um, there's a neighboring province that's having a terrible drought. And the magistrate, as this is one version of the story, comes and asks Milan, woman, if he'll come to the temple and perform his rituals and bring rain in this drought. And so he goes, you know, and. Um, a day or two go by, goes by, and the um, 
Magistrate comes in, Numan's just sitting there, just sitting, Sazen. And the magistrate's like, what are you doing? You know, we asked you to do your, your rituals. And, um, you know, he's sort of looking for um, supernatural powers. And what are you doing? One translation is silently not influencing anything. <laughs> And the story goes, you know, the next day the rains came. And I was, this is um, not really about magic for me, or I mean, it, you know, I, I really love this, this sense of this world that, of utter wonder and awe and its dynamism that we just miss. We don't have a clue, like Unman's sense of it where, you know, strike a carp in the Eastern Sea and it leaps up and overturns a pan in the heavens and it rains torrents, you know, somewhere. And that's his world, you know, it's just, um, I can't remember, but, you know, like a rabbit on the bottom of the ocean eats porridge and a frog up in the heaven washes the bowl, something, I mean, I know I'm getting that all wrong, but it's just, <laughs> It's like I mentioned this lovely student who remembered being a child and lying on the grassy ground and looking up at the, at the clouds in the sky. And, and it was like, there's the ocean and the clouds are swimming. And um, it's that kind of world. That doesn't even begin to get at this dynamism you know, that, that any of this is going on. So. So in that sense, talking about magic or supernatural is just like, where would you draw the line? You know, we're here, whatever this is, what is this? Um, I, was, I was touched at this retreat with John Gaynor that I've mentioned. He's so near to Dogen and this practice realization. You know, John told that story. Actually, I told it to him and then in a talk, he, he told it. And you know, I just thought, well, he's lifting up this lovely story. And he, you know, he told it with care and a kind of love. And then he said, but I'm not quite sure I agree. <laughs> you know? that we're not influencing anything. I mean, we don't, we, you know, I think it would be really misguided I, personally to say I'm sitting so that I can end the war in the Ukraine or, uh, you know, completely change course in climate change and, you know, species extinction and, or in the coronavirus, I'm sitting for that. I mean, fine to have those intentions, but it's, it's like what he's talking about is not that kind of manipulation of reality. It's just, this is so one, this entirety, and so dynamic at, you know, this, empty, infinite, how, how could it not matter throughout the whole body? But to say, I'm calculating that it's gonna do this, which magic sometimes tends to use that language, I think Zen would not. Thank you, Don. Okay, I think it's time now to uh, come to a close and we'll still have one more Q&A tomorrow if there are any questions that, that surface. And yeah, thank you for uh, asking, listening, for so um, taking in this Q&A in the spirit of session. You know, this is a change, but there's a way that we're intimate.
but somehow hearing the silence in all these sounds. So thank you. <laughs>